Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Your host is Deborah Rue, CEO of Rue Global Impact and co-founder and chairwoman of Billion Strong, an identity and empowerment organization designed to bring billions of voices of persons with disabilities together. To join the global community and to donate to the cause, visit billion-strong.org. That's billion-strong.org. And now, on to the episode. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Rue, and I'm the CEO of Rue Global Impact and also the executive chair of Billion Strong. Um, really excited that y'all joined me today. This is the day before Thanksgiving here in the States, and I have a Canadian on. So, um, <laughs> Cam Bodin and, um, is with Accelerated Accessibility. And I actually met him when we interviewed him on Access Chat, and he blew me away. I thought, how did I not know about this man's work? He just blew me away. He is so strong and so good for our industry. So he has worked, you know, with big brands and everything, but he really understands this in a way that I'd like to see the accessibility field um, follow his lead a little bit more. So let me just real quick do a visual description. I am a mature woman with gray and white and purple hair, and today I'm wearing bluish glasses and um, a black sweater with a ton of colorful buttons because everybody knows how much I love my bling and my color. So Kim, welcome to the program. Hey, Deborah, thanks so much. I'm going to give a quick description of myself as well. I'm a 30-something-year-old white male. I've got this great headset on and a snazzy black accessibility cap with the hashtag A11Y on it as well. And thanks so much for having me on the show here. I can't wait to talk about what we're going to talk about today. I agree. And I think that the thing that I love about your voice is that um, and I guess we're bad about loving voices that sing, that that remind of our, our own, but I just love how you know that accessibility has to be blended into every single aspect of what we do. And um, I also know that you started your business and then you've, you've you know, worked for some big brands, but you, you were mentioning that you were in an entrepreneurial conference last week. And I thought, maybe we can start there because actually when you were explaining it to me off air cam, um, I started to get really stoked about it. So do that, but also talk a little bit more about accelerated accessibility and cam, do we need another accessibility consulting business? Right. Let me let me back up just a little bit here because I come from that world of big business and corporate and and I know I'm fortunate to to be in that kind of world but when I started off my my real entry into corporate was for a big consulting firm three letters blue uh blue text uh, and and they were really great at teaching us that every single role every single person is allowed to be an advocate for whatever you do. If you're a developer and you want to talk about blockchain, you want to go pitch that to the client that you're working for, you're consulting with, go for it. Just bring a salesperson with you. Or if you're a designer and you want to bring in Figma or a new design style, go for it and go pitch that to the clients. Just bring a salesperson with you. So here I am and I'm thinking, I've got this great thing called accessibility. Can I just bring a salesperson with me? And they're saying, well, we don't even know what accessibility yeah. really is. So I had to shoulder so much of that knowledge and and the business acumen. But they were so good at doing things like, how do you present to clients? How do you talk to stakeholders? How do you talk to business owners? How do you build a pitch deck that really makes a lot of sense? And I think that's one of the things that's really lacking and really missing in our industry. We are so passionate. We're so, you know, we, we think that the advocacy part is so important. And it is. It yeah. absolutely is. But if you're not able to sit in a room full of people who have no idea what accessibility is and speak in a way that speaks to them, that they're going to recognize and understand what accessibility and the meaning and the outcomes and the return on investments of like, why should I do this? Then you're unfortunately going to usually get pushed to the back and say, well, yeah, but we'd rather upgrade our whatever technology stack. It's, it's a higher priority to us. And so that's really what I want to teach. And that's really what I want to focus on. Uh, when I speak about accessibility consulting, I will actually lean on other people now to, treat, to teach about the development, to teach about the design stuff. But I want to go speak to business owners and I want to go speak to leaders about how, what is the return on investment on focusing on your clients with disabilities? Because that's what rings their bells. That's what really makes them want to, want to care about this. And good or bad, that's the reality of what they hear. And that's the reality of what they, uh, uh, what they want to uh, learn. 
So yes, off air, we were speaking a little bit about a, an entrepreneur's conference I just came back from. And I watched people who are speaking about well-being and other DEI topics or, or you know, how to create experts or, or MBA uh, coaching programs. And that really got me fired up because I'm like, we are doing exactly that. Aren't we? Aren't we, Deborah? Yes. When, I, when you go in and talk to other advocates, aren't we teaching and coaching organizations or teams? And I'm watching them do the same thing for corporate wellness. Why can't we do that? Why aren't we going in there approaching this like a business? Why aren't we going in there and talking about this and asking for budget money and understanding budget cycles and, 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 uh, and financials as well? We should be going in there and having those same types of conversations with those same people. And they're buying those. They're buying those professionals. And we should go in there doing the same thing. I agree, Cam. And yet, we really are not doing that. We're not. We're not we're doing not. that. And I, I don't have this happen anymore. <clears throat> but when I first started, I came from corporate America, as we like to say, and um, start, I was pitching it and, th and they wouldn't even hear me. And then I would have things like, do, do people with disabilities even use the Internet? Now, I've been doing this a long time. And, and, I, and I don't think blind people use the and, and it was like. I, I've I mean, got no clients with disabilities, right? Like I, I've got no right. clients. My, my, my clients are rich. They don't have any disabilities. Right, right. And so it's, it's been very interesting to watch it unfold, but we actually have made progress. We do have advocacy all over the world. Lots more needs to be done, but I do not believe that we're thinking about these things like you are, right. like you're saying. How do we, I was talking to somebody the other day, I've mentioned this on air before, I was talking to a very senior leader that's working on a huge metaverse project. And I said to him, you need to make sure it's accessible. He's like, oh, right. oh, you mean Section 508? And I said, no, I do not mean Section 508. I'm not having a compliance conversation with you right now. I'm saying to you that if we do not make sure the metaverse is fully accessible, you are going to fall off that bell-shaped right. curve. You, because you are like me in your 60s, you are personally going to fall off of it. So if you don't care about the billion of pe billions of people with disabilities, care about yourself. You personally are guaranteed to fall off that. Right. You're going to because you're a human being. So, Kim, we, we really do need to make our industry more professional. And I'll mm -hmm. say one more thing. I remember a man one time who was building HR systems and um, he approached me and I said, well, are your systems accessible? And he's like, oh yeah, you can get on 24 seven. Okay. Nope. Don't mean that. Um, but he's like, I told him what it was and he was like, oh, well, I will allow you to go in and test and tell me what I need to do to make it fully accessible. And you can actually go into the code and change all that and stuff. We'll allow you to do that for free since you're so passionate about your community. And I said, yeah, that is not going to happen. I said, uh, you know, that's not going to happen, but please do not think I'm going to recommend your products. I will not because they're not accessible. So right. those days are gone, hopefully, but yeah. So over to you, Cam. Yeah. So you brought up a lot of like really, really interesting topics. I want to talk about advocacy in general, because that is such a term nowadays that we it is so in our face. Let, let's talk about some of the other movements that are going on right now, right? Environmental movements, Black Lives Matter, Stop Asian Hate, LGBTQ2 plus movements, um, women's rights. You know, these are all very, very important topics. Mm -hmm. And I like to look at those other movements and those other groups and say, well, what are they doing? What are they doing that is working in the industry? And the amazing thing is that I, I like to quantify it like how, if you can imagine a scale in your mind and you can say, okay, how important is this? I don't know of any business or hiring manager now who walks in and says, I, lead, I need less representation in, in who I hire now. You know, no one's saying that. I don't know any CEO or, or leader who's saying, you know, let's undiversify our workforce because there's like no one is saying that. So when I start to when I start the conversation on accessibility, when I start the conversation on disability inclusion, I start there. I, I start there and I say, well, look, you've already diversified your workforce and you already have employees with disabilities. You don't even know it yet. And let me show you, you've got a workforce of what, a thousand people, one in seven having disability. We can start to add numbers to that stats and start to say, we've got people right now in your team 
who are don't have proper accommodations for their work. So let's talk about uh, your employee belonging first. Because a lot of people are talking about belonging right now, aren't they? Mm-hmm. A lot of people now see value in having employees who feel belonging at work. Quiet quitting is going to be avoided. And there are financial benefits to talking about that. And when you can start to add that dollar figure in, again, we're talking about being professional in the way that we speak. I'm not talking about let's add ramps. That's not, We're not there yet. We're not there in the conversation yet. I'm just talking about how do we make sure that your your employees don't quit because you're creating an unfriendly work uh, workplace for them. So and when I think reality- advocacy... I, I, I'm sorry, yeah. um, but go ahead. Uh, but uh, the reality is your employees are quitting over these things. They, yeah, are, they are. If you are not making a difference to make the world a better place, and one way you can do it is this way, they will quietly quit. But ex- right. I do not mean to interrupt you, so continue. Your no, but, but we won't even know, right? They, they, a lot of people, a lot I, of uh, organizations don't even know why people are quitting. And I'm giving an example right now. Uh, uh, throw in there, I've got, I, I've got a show as well, and, and, and I, I – uh, I'm having a guest come on the show in the new year, and she is an HR consultant and then specializing in accommodations. And I can't wait to speak with her on air about this because she is going to be giving tips to both employers and employees of how do we disclose at work. And this type of conversation is that no one is telling anybody explicitly how to do things. We, 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 we tend to, uh, I don't want to say stand on our soapbox because that sounds wrong to say. I don't want like the negative connotation around that. But I am sometimes so passionate, and I come from the developer world. I was a developer by trade. But going in and talking about alt text or labels or, or keyboard only uh, to, to a stakeholder or a business owner, they're like, that's not my realm. That's not what I care about. And, I, and I'm not able to apply that. But if I go in and start really talking about, well, you know, here's how you can provide good accommodation for people with ADHD who are at your workplace. And we know they're at your workplace. Like, I have stats and say, this is how many people have ADHD on average in the population. This is how you can make a, 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 your workplace better for them. Oh, all of a sudden that is a next step. I really focus on what is the next step that anyone can, can apply. Again, we tend to focus on let's revamp your entire website. No one's going to do that. No, one, like first off, if you approach somebody and say your entire website's broken for accessibility, like the example you just gave, right? Well, you go in and fix it. I don't know what the next step is for me. You right. go in and fix it all. Uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about here is the next step that you can take tomorrow. It costs you next to nothing, and all I'm telling you is you get your developers the habit of pressing tab and enter uh, before they release uh, before they they push code. When you can reduce something to like a bite-sized, bite-sized deliverable, a bite-sized task that someone can do, all of a sudden the the cost of doing that is, is nothing. And you start there. You start there at the low cost, no cost elements. And mm-hmm. you say, this is your next step in your procurement, in your design, in your development. I, I was challenging someone the other day. How many of your developers care about accessibility? Oh, quite a few of them. I got like a lot of people who care about accessibility. Great. How many of them are empowered to apply their accessibility comments on their Figma projects uh, uh, that the designers are working on? Well, zero of them. If, if you're not going to increase your collaboration and communication, you're going to have a really hard time with this because if a developer is not empowered to give feedback on the designs that they're working on, it's going to be really hard for them to, uh, uh, to be able to, to, to help each other uh, build on this accessibility, you know, this accessibility thing to, to improve your, uh, your, your, your capacity to, to help accessibility. Which is a great point, and I just want to ground that point with one of my customers. Uh, I know that I was asked by one of my large telecommunications customers in the States to come in and train them on mm-hmm. RE and really in accessibility deep dives, uh, the, the content providers, the programmers, the, um, the executive, blah, 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 different groups. So I'm in there with some very seasoned talent ta- trainers because they were actually starting to get over my head because I do know accessibility, but I no longer am a programmer or coder. I don't do that yep. anymore. So I respect that I have not done that in a while. So I bring in people that have. So um, what was really, really surprising, though, was so many of these t- technologists in this big company, they knew accessibility. They knew yep. it in some ways better than I did. And I, at one point I stopped and I, or as well, certainly, or even better. And I stopped and I said, on break and I said, all right, I'm confused. If y'all know this so well, why are you do, not doing it? And they said, nobody is going to appreciate 
if we step up and just start making things accessible. We will, it will not be appreciated. We will be told, we didn't ask you to do that. Why are you doing it? So we've been waiting for them to tell us we can do it. They yeah. knew how to do it already, Cam, but they just, and you know that's true. Yes. That's yep. What's yep. True. I programmed for years. Mm -hmm. I don't just, I didn't say, well, you know, I think if I had created this own program over here and just did it, no, no, no. They told me what I had to do. They told me. So, yep. and, and by the way, they didn't tell me to add things I wanted. Mm -hmm. I know, but you don't understand. This is better. Yeah. No, I didn't do that as a programmer. I did, you know, sort of what I was told because I wanted to yep. get a job. Now, that's a long time ago, but still, how, you know, so I would just say to you, Kim, if I am an individual in this situation and I do know how to do it, but the company I'm with don't want to hear it, what's your suggestion? The best thing anybody can do is get promoted. <laughs> and you know what? That's not the answer anyone wants to hear. You know, I want to hear, give me some techniques on how do I talk about accessibility? How do I convince? I get that all the time. Mm -hmm. I get that all the time. How do I convince my boss to care about accessibility? You know what you do? You do the best job as a developer that you can. You get promoted to lead developer. And then every single member on your team is going to care about, about accessibility by association. Because you, as a developer who cares about accessibility, will all of a sudden not let any ticket through when you need to approve those tickets pushing up that is inaccessible. I've done it before. I have halted development processes as a lead developer when I said, what is going on here? You call yourselves accessibility developers and I'm seeing you know, missing alt text or labels or what have you. What are you doing adding all these roles? Like, what is this? I don't care if it's a component that was, um, that, you know, that doesn't have accessibility. Well, how do we scope in the time to fix this and make this component accessible? Now, all of a sudden, I've gone from a voice of one caring about accessibility to a team of eight caring about accessibility. Think of how much more impact you get with a team of eight instead of a voice of one, oh, right? Yes. And, 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 and that's, that is something I talk about quite often. And in fact, yes, I, I talk a lot about communication methods. I talk about top-down communication. I talk about, you know, how do we build uh, stakeholder personas it, when, we, when we speak to stakeholders in presentation methods. Maybe we can get into that a little bit later. That's a big part of, I know you have a key talk. I've got one key, everyone calls me for the, my communications talk. But when I talk about, when I hear a junior person, how do I, you know, how do I get better accessibility? How do I get my boss to care? You don't, you don't, because they're only going to care about what help, what relates to them. Best thing you can do is get promoted as, you know, lead, a lead QA. Can you imagine if every single lead QA right now yes. in the world of software development care about accessibility? Uh, wow. We would be seeing, we would be seeing such a change in our industry because they all of a sudden would say, we've all got whatever Max core or, you know, uh, Microsoft insights or whichever, whichever browser tool, they would all have it. They would all know how to use a screen reader as part of their, their testing process. They would all push for continuous integration pipeline, uh, with, with whatever, uh, uh, scanning auditing tool, uh, as part of it, they would help, they would help ensure that developers, when they push code as well, and they have to check it, they said, Hey, I now have to tell on you because I've seen six times that you didn't, you know, apply, uh, you know, the color, the correct color contrast to this tool. Like I'm going to go tell your boss because it's been six times now that I've told you. Mm -hmm. Imagine, imagine if we had uh, had QA leads or dev leads or design leads or content leads, business leads, scrum scrum uh, leads, like all care about that in a way. So the best thing that you can do for the for the industry is become. Like go get promoted in your job. Do the best job that you can. Get promoted, then your entire team will care about accessibility going forward. And I agree. I, I agree. I, I interviewed uh, Dave Dom from Microsoft, mm. and he is a is a Canadian, and he is um, a gentleman with a physical disability, and he was hired as a major leader at Microsoft because he's so mm -hmm. talented, and he has a very large amount of employees reporting to him. And mm -hmm. a few months after working, he sent them all notes and said, what is it like to work for a person with a disability? Is it, has this been valuable? Is this, and they all came back with such positive comments. And I thought Absolutely. that is how you start changing things. Yeah. Now, this means very talented, but it, it does give me hope. There is some hope, but at the same time, yeah. I often hear I often hear the conversations that are being started. Um, we are just not talking about the right things. And, and, right, right. And I'll give you a, 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 a little example. I was speaking uh, at a conference in the States, and somebody said, 
well, where do we begin? How do we begin? And somebody else said, oh, just go hire a person with a disability. Well, I do live in the beautiful United States of America, and we do believe in litigation. That's right. I saw your Canadian maple uh, leaf. But um, we sue people in the United States, and yep. we are good at it. And so you, I always say to them, you understand that we sue you, right? So, and, and I've had people say, you Americans need to stop doing that. We're not going to stop doing it. It's the way we do it. It's messy. That's what we do. And because we're doing that, it is actually leading to global change. Messy, but at the same yeah. time. So mm -hmm. how do we, you know, how do we really talk to the stakeholders? How do we really do that, Cam? Because um, it's sort of different depending on where you are also. And yeah. We, yeah, you're talking to a, a brand that's in multiple countries, whole another different conversation. Yeah. So first off, big shout out to Dave. I know Dave. I met him at uh, Accessibility Toronto, the LETO conference up here for the first time. And he and I were like having a gas. It was it was so great to meet it's him. Wonderful. What I, what I really appreciate about Dave and when I started to really talk to him about uh, accessibility, you know, he doesn't come from the accessibility background, no. right? You know that he was a scrum, a scrum coach, scrum master lead. I, I don't remember the exact title, but something like 20, 30 years, like he was teaching mm -hmm. about scrum. So he had nothing to do with the accessibility industry, which is why it's so refreshing when he comes in and says, ah, how do I tackle this problem, this industry nuances from a business point of view? How do I tackle it from a, I know how to talk to stakeholders. It's not about my disability. It's about their problems and their uh, the initiatives that they're trying to create. And I was the same as him when I start having conversations with stakeholders. And first off, I've been hearing about you know what a persona is, right? Like we yes. create user personas all the time for anyone who's in the audience who maybe doesn't know. So usually if you're in a user research kind of role, sometimes developers see this, sometimes everyone else sees it. You're creating a profile of somebody who is an ideal client or who's a typical user or something like that. Did you know, did you know that you can create personas of stakeholders as well? And I do that. <laughs> so what, you know, and so if I'm thinking of, of, okay, I've got to go present yeah. to a, yeah, I've got to go pre present to a, um, let's just say, um, head of people, head of people at, you know, one, two, three corporation. Okay. I'm going to actually sit down for 15 minutes and create, what would is it, what does a head of people, you know, care about? What would they care about? And maybe Deborah, Hey, let's have some fun and let's create it together here. Okay. For any users. Um, what do you think? Let's throw it out. What would a head of people really care about at, uh, at a large corporation? What do you um, they would want to be an employer of choice. Yep. Yep. They uh, would mm -hmm. want to have a diverse um, mm -hmm. program that met their company's goals, diversity mm -hmm. goals. Yep. I would say they want to increase retention, right? Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that people uh, they stay for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And they would probably want to at least understand accommodations, yes. right? To understand what people might need. Um, they may want to simplify their uh, their application process as well as how do people actually come in. Um, they may also care about what type of of um, uh, websites or or hiring, you know, recruiting processes that they're doing as well. These are all kind of little things I do. But the, intersections, go speak to the intersections of diversity, because that can be what the heart burns. And that's mm -hmm. where we come into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yep. it. They, so, so I'm going to write all those elements down and what do I know about the company too? So I'm going to write down things like how many people are at that company. So I have an idea of when I'm speaking to this person, how many people do they care about? You know, it, it's going to be a different conversation if it's a head of people of a company of 150 to 15, 1500. Like, you know, like it's a different type of conversation as higher you go. And now to anyone who's listening, maybe you're not, maybe you've never spoken to someone who's a head of or CTO or whatever. But this is going to be the same type of process that I use no matter what. I create a profile of the person I'm going to go present to. And from that, then I can start to tailor and cater the way I talk to this person based on what I know about them already. So I gave the example of someone who cares for you know 150 people compared to 1,500. Well, if you have 1,500 employees, you're probably going to value a little bit more things like um, stakeholder or like VP uh, conversations, right? And maybe a little bit less of the day-to-day hands-on of each individual person. If you got 1,500 people that you care right. about, you just don't have time to speak to 1,500. But 150, maybe you do know by name every single person because you were involved in that hiring process. After I'm creating this profile of someone, well, what's relevant to them? 
So what's relevant to them? So we mentioned a few things like, uh, like maybe if I'm using Indeed versus some of the other kind of like recruiting websites uh, versus LinkedIn, right? Like I'm, I'm using these two different websites to recruit. Okay. So in that conversation, I'm going to bring up examples of where I've seen the, uh, the, the job postings of my uh, other, so I make it 100% relevant to them. Let's use LinkedIn as an example. By the way, I do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. That's where you can find me the most. If I'm re- if this company is recruiting on LinkedIn, I'm going to pull up LinkedIn, a LinkedIn job posting in the presentation or conversation with that. So they can be 100% clear on what, uh, w- how relevant this is to them. I'm not going to go and just use examples or it's just like when I do job postings, this is the things I'm caring about. No, I'm going to pull up LinkedIn and say, look at this, look at this, this is thing. And this is how a user would experience this job posting right here, right now. I make it hyper relevant to that one person because that is how it's going to stick. Then they're going to walk away from that conversation saying, wow, when Deborah presented that to me, when Cam presented that to me, when John presented that to me, all of a sudden, I, I get it. Like I get it because they, it's it's impossible the next time that they do a posting on LinkedIn or they send one of their team members to post on LinkedIn that they're not going to think of, ah, and don't forget, if you put a picture on that post in LinkedIn, did you know that LinkedIn has the option to add an alt text to that? Or let's post on LinkedIn because it's easy to press one button and apply to our role. Or maybe in the way that we build this job posting here, we don't need to write that somebody needs to, there's a chance that somebody needs to hold or carry uh, 60 pounds uh, because they're doing a desk job. Like we can move away from that standard um, uh, like writing of, of job postings. You know, and this is the way I make it hyper relevant to the person I'm talking to. And if it's, a, and I can do this if it's a group of stakeholders or a, or a team of developers or things like that. But that's how I start to make it, it really relevant to the people who are listening. Oh, which is such a good point. I know you also are a very big advocate for the accessibility community. And um, why, do you, why do you think that many accessibility um, professionals aren't really equipped to do their jobs? Hmm. So it's a really good question because we are not taught, I think we've talked about this a lot now, we are not taught how to go up to stakeholders. Like, look, I, I don't know how you just started. I know for me, I started off, I was the go-to accessibility guy. So I'd get pulled into this one meeting yes. with, you know, a group of testers. Hey, Cam, just go do a, uh, just go do a, a presentation for all these testers. And, you know, you got to kind of research this technical stuff or um, go, go and present to, uh, you know, like I said, head of HR and all these other VPs, because all of a sudden we care about it. And yet, so our industry is a bunch of people who really care. Like I care about, yes. about people. I care about people, period. But just because I care about people, we don't have a formal, like, let's do this and then let's learn about this and let's move in this. So we've talked a lot about that idea of communication and that idea of what are some of the other skills that we need to learn that are outside of the, you know, just the WCAG. That's so much what we focus on. We focus so much on these technical aspects of, okay, I am a developer. I need to learn the accessibility guidelines and then the accessibility expert for the rest of the organization. That's hard. That's hard for someone to put in that role um, to be able to, uh, to comment on. Or maybe you are the accommodation specialist in HR. You can't. You cannot go down to uh, the, the, the designers and say, yeah, this is how you should fix your, your color contrast or this is how you should create components in a way that's reusable, you know, things like that. So I think that our industry really starts to, has, has to start thinking about if you want to be a consultant in accessibility, if you want to be an advocate in accessibility, or you need to start thinking of what are some of the skills outside of just these core technical skills to uh, to grow your influence or to grow your 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 knowledge. And I think that's really down to the more basic stuff that we we tend to push aside: um, communication skills, presentation skills, uh, uh, in, like how do we raise our influence, how do we persuade people, and these are skills like any other skill that you can learn. I promise you, go on YouTube and you can watch one hour videos on how to persuade people. Yes. Yeah, cool. Persuasion. Let's not convince people to do it. No, 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 no. Everything is persuasion. You're a human, you sell. That's just yes. a reality. Whether it's you want to convince your mom you want ice cream or the one you want to convince your boss to care about, you know, putting accessibility into the next, uh, into the next release. You're going to have to persuade someone. These are skills like any other that we need to work. Oh, that's such a good point. Um, what are, you, you mentioned that some skills, but are there other skills that accessibility um, professionals can um, tap into to really, you know, expand their, 
you know, what they're doing and their impact. Sure. So I would really lean on also, you know, pure business skills. So one thing that I've really benefited from working in these larger organizations and corporations as an employee or as a consultant contractor from the external to help out with this is understanding really the basics of things like budget cycles. Like if you're going to go in and, and if, you get, if you get an objection from a lead, a stakeholder, a VP who says it's not in the budget for this year, it's true. Like I know large corporations who have 18 months, but can you believe that? Or that, you know, large corporations right now in January are budgeting for 2025. Mm -hmm. 20, that's, that's two years away. So when they say we don't have budget or it wasn't in the budget plan, they're not lying to you. They don't hate right. people with disabilities. They just simply don't have budget. Aha. So the next question isn't, you don't care. The next question is, so when's the next budget cycle that I can book you in for? And then I book that. I put that in their calendar for the next two Absolutely. months. I say, hey, last time we spoke about you didn't have budget cycle. Next month, you got this planned. How can we fit accessibility into this? And having confidence in talking about that. Because again, that's their language. If we want to move the industry forward, we have to start speaking their language. We have to learn from both sides. And I agree. And when I started, I started in 2000. And I started because I'm a mother with it. You know, I have a daughter with Down syndrome. I did not know at the time when I started that I was part of the community. I am neurodiverse, ADHD. I just was not diagnosed. Makes a lot more sense now. But, but I was often treated like I didn't belong in the field. And what are you doing here? Which shocked me because I thought, well, I'm a technologist and a programmer. I mean, y'all have a lot of work to do. But I really was surprised at the time how I was treated when I first moved into what I consider the disability inclusion and accessibility field, because I am part of, uh, you know, very proud to be part of this community and trying to p change people's minds about what it means to be part of this community. But at the same time, I see people not knowing where to even begin. They don't even know where to begin. And once again, I was mentioning um, that talk when somebody said, where do we begin? And the first person on this panel said, just hire somebody, that just hire a place with disability. And then it came to me and I said, you're a corporation. You should never, huh? we never, ever just do something. We plan right. about it and we put a program and we put a, you know, we track with yeah. where the gaps. Corporations do not just go and hire a person. That is not the way it works. And I even said, and if you do, and sitting right next to me was a lawyer, a lawyer that actually happens to have a disability working for a gigantic law firm. But he's like, yep, you're going to come see me then. So you do have to have a plan. You're a business. You're a business. So what do you recommend to your clients when they're first starting this conversation? Where do, where do they really start? So... I want to remind everyone that if you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. And that answer of just go hire someone with a disability is you're going to get one opinion and one perspective mm -hmm. and one thing like that. So I do want to place a lot of value in somebody who has researched and learned and, and spent time developing their skills for a understanding of what disabilities are like this. This is a like, it, it's not a small thing to go and read the accessibility guidelines and to learn about what it really means to have Down syndrome or really learns like to understand how someone with uh, who is blind or, or has a vision impairment, how do they really use their tools? Because I learned from watching. I learned from learning. In fact, I've got a great story. Do we have time for a story? We got time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So when I first started out, I was, uh, like I told you, I was a developer at that large consulting firm. And um, I, 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 I was, working on fixing tickets and stuff like that. There are all these accessibility flagged tickets. And uh, my friend Tom was the traveling accessibility guy at, at the company. So um, he would be called in, come help us train and learn about accessibility and, and that's it. And I, here I was, the developer, the junior dev, like assigned to accessibility on it. And so I watched, when he came around to our office, I watched my, you know, A-type typical uh, boss type be like, Oh, hey, Tom, my name's Jim. And he stuck his hand out in Tom's face. But Tom, being blind, didn't even know that there was a hand out stretch. And he said, oh, great, Jim. It's nice to meet you. And, you know, there was that moment where, uh, where you know, this A-type personality type of person was like, had his hand out stretched. And he's like, you know, who's going to flinch first? I put my hand out. But it, but it was like, it was, that was, 
I, I died of embarrassment. I, I, I melted. <laughs> I, I ran back to my desk and I went to YouTube and I typed in how to shake a blind person's hand. And I learned that all you need to do is just say, can I shake your hand? By just stating that word, by just stating that saying, can I shake your hand was enough to cue somebody to say, oh yeah, to put their hand up and shake it, right? And now I do that all the time. If I'm meeting someone who is vision impaired, I just do it instinctively. There is value in learning things like that. And, and there is value to people who have those skills who have said, I'm in, interested and, and empathetic towards this. And I need to learn a little bit more about what the industry is all about. And they go to conferences and they meet people with disabilities and they understand deeply how somebody with a disability may, and I use that word may, interact with technology or with the world or with whatever, you know, how they want to be hired. And that's, that's valuable. And that's where I see kind of our industry moving towards, or I'd like to see it move towards is that we need to see ourselves as that bridge between people with disabilities and corporations or companies or want to understand. We do not replace. I am not, I am not the replacement for people with disabilities in an organization or anything like that. And I don't call myself that. Yes, you need to understand real lived experiences, but you've met one person with disability. You've met one person with disability. And that doesn't mean they are part, they, they represent the whole uh, mm -hmm. as well. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that, that, that's a really big part of what I think we do. I agree. And I think also, you know, these are really in-depth problems and the nuanced. And you, you start g getting with these gigantic corporations that have billions of objects and moving things. And it becomes, it becomes a, it's a really big deal. And yep. um, I often hear um, corporations in the United States saying they do not feel our accessibility industry really understands the complexity of their problems. Absolutely. And um, and we actually have seen over the years quite a few of our corporations here in the United States leaving and working with consultants in other countries because they actually are being more thoughtful about it. Well, here we're going to sue the heck out of you. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. and I'm and I I'm proud of my country, so I don't mean it like that, but. I, I, at the same time, I hear what people are saying and doing, and, and it really, really hurts my heart. You know, some of these, not all the accessibility overlays, there's actually some accessibility overlays that are helpful to our industry, as long as you're not trying to use them as a shortcut of the right. right. Absolutely. But can I add in there something? Because that's a please. really important point I want, I want to bring up. And I would like to challenge anyone who, who, immediately discounts any kind of uh, AI tool or, or I, I don't, I don't advocate for overlays. I don't require yeah. like recommend them at all. Nope. But have you ever called up a company of an overlay company? I have, I called yeah. the chief marketing officer of an, of an overlay company. I said, I need you to tell me from your point of view, why you're so good or why you're like, how do you handle that? And they have a team of 60, 70, 80 people and half of them have a disability. Right. And out of those 30, I mean, just use the example if there were 60, 30 people with disabilities double check that overlay and make sure that any new feature that goes out is functional, is usable, is useful. And they all say, yeah, yeah, I like, I like this feature. Right. So we can't say, we can't like immediately discount anything. And when a company takes a shortcut or, or something, that is one person who is, who cares about accessibility. They cared enough to go and investigate, invest the time and the energy. You know, I, you're right. With corporations, nothing is ever done. You always need a council and a and a let's let's procure this and let's like that is time and effort and money and money, right? And money. So large corporations need to spend the time, effort, and money to go and procure that. And somebody spearheaded that and said, This is important. And they made a mistake. Right. Okay. Or or they didn't, they they weren't aware of what the community is. And yes, that is something that we need to coach on. Say, by the way, by the way, if you have this overlay on every single page, this is the these this is the impact it causes. It does not mean Blast them on this. Or uh, this happened recently with with uh, with I think Meetup.com. Meetup.com put an overlay on their website, and I was just I, I was shocked to see that the response wasn't, "Hey, let's send some emails and let's coach people on how to fix oh, that." Maybe. And again, they, I wasn't called by by Meetup and said like, "Hey, Cam, do you recommend this or anything like that?" But I saw the outcome of this, and I said, "This one poor." procurement person thought this was a great idea because they cared enough to invest the time, energy, and money to figuring this out. And then we just blast them. So you know what they're going to say tomorrow? Too complicated. I'd rather get sued. I'd rather get sued because I don't know what to do right. So how can, how can we move the industry forward if that's what the feeling is? I agree. And also, well, 
I can't do anything to help people with disabilities. They criticize me too much. So That's I'm right. going to go over here and I'm going to help the African-Americans or the black mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go help LGBTQIA. Well, no, we, we, we really want to help everybody, but we actually have to help them. Uh, Kim, I, I've already kept you longer than I said. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I love talking to you. But I want, I want to ask you one more, two more questions. Um, the first is, it, should I just start um, accessibility and just look at my website? I, I, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about that. And then the second one is, I want you to tell the audience how they can come to you, how they can come to Accelerated Accessibility and work with y'all. Um, I, I want to make sure people know how to get to your podcast. And I love all of the, um, the data that you have on your website. It's so powerful. So I highly recommend people visiting it. If you were a, if you were a consultant yourself, go and look what he's doing. It's really powerful. And he has a lot of good stuff out there that we all can use. I like highlighting people that are helping. So I, that's why I definitely wanted to highlight you, Kim. But so should I just start with web accessibility? Is that the first thing I should do? You, you know what? I don't really care where people start as long as they start. Like that's that's usually my default answer because starting is the hardest thing. And I think that, you know, like we just mentioned, there's so many different paths or avenues to get started. Like, oh my God, I don't know if I want to start with my hiring or get started here. Like just start, start anywhere to raise the interest level within the organization and the empathy towards there. And you know what? If you're a tech leading firm, like you're going to have different priorities than a design firm. Like, you know what? Like, to, and, and a design firm, yeah, they may, you know, if their website, that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, but it's concrete. And that's one thing. I don't do audits anymore. Mm. Um, I refer out to all my audits. I, I find that, that my time is much better coaching and teaching leadership teams on how to build accessibility or how to, how to build programs of accessibility. I think that's much, that's what my, but I refer people to go to this auditing team or that auditing team uh, to get that if they need tangible. And you know what? I've, I've seen, you know, people like if it's a chief technology officer, a CTO who calls me up, yeah, I'll probably say start with your website because that's, again, tangible for them. Right. Again, different from what if it's a chief people officer or a VP, you know, I'll ask them, well, where do you want to start? Where do you feel the biggest pain point is? Have you been sued? Like, where, where, where do we need to start first? And that's where, you know, the involvement of what I do. And that, that'll lead into what I, what I really offer. I'm a speaker, a coach and trainer. And I, I, I like to say that anyone who follows me are accelerators. We are all accelerating accessibility. So where are my accelerators, right? So I've got a weekly show on LinkedIn. If you follow me, it's got a, I've got a weekly show. Um, I've got, I've got people who specialize in ADHD. I've got uh, influencers with disabilities, but I do lead with business first conversations too, right? And I actually ask in my show, what is business? What is the business uh, lacking in the world of accessibility? You know, like where have you seen the business conversation fail in accessibility? Because I want to hear from people in the industry. You know, where where are businesses failing? Where is your business failing? You know, in the new year, I've got uh, in 2023, I've got. CEOs of organizations uh, coming in and they're going to, you know, I'm going to be asking them, where did you start? Where did you start? Because I want to hear from them because when they start to reveal where their pain points are or their pain points were, how does that help us in the community to say, ah, I knew that that CEO on that podcast said that he had a hard time with this one thing. That's where we're going to spend our energy to go and uh, uh, to go and speak. So um, you can follow me uh, on LinkedIn is where like I said, I post a lot of things. Cam Baudouin, I'm sure you know, the spelling of that will be in the show notes. Uh, you can go to my website, cambodwine.com. And if anyone who's listening uh, wants to bring me on as a speaker or coach, I do keynote speeches. I do, I, I can build panels together. I know I'm so deeply involved in the world of, of, of uh, disability inclusion. So I have people with disabilities. And I found that those types of uh, panels, having mm-hmm. actual people with disabilities come in and speak, that mm-hmm. tends to resonate so, so well. But I also help train uh, accessibility teams because I know a lot of large organizations they try to, you know, let's just figure out this accessibility thing. Let's pull a bunch of consultants together and figure that out. And yet they're not empowered to do things. But back to our part of our conversation here about uh, how do we get them to speak up and speak out? That's one of the big talks I give as well. But that's where I do a lot of my posting is all on LinkedIn. So best place to reach out to me is there or send me an email, cam at cambodway.com. And I will also say to the audience, because Kim made me think of this as he was saying it, it's, it's, especially here in the United States, it's, it's expensive to hire uh, talent with accessibility experience. And they, you, they deserve it. They deserve every, every penny that they make. 
but I see sometimes uh, when uh, groups are going to create an accessibility team, they'll go out and they'll start trying to hire and they'll realize how expensive it is. For example, Cam, I have uh, somebody that is in Europe and mm -hmm. they want to hire for uh, the United States. And so they started looking and they were shocked at what the salary requirements were. And yeah. they actually were surprised that they couldn't really find one person that had all the skills. They actually are going to have to hire two people that has this skill and this skill, put them together. So that's like almost um, over a $300,000 a year price tag. Right, right. Over. It, it's much over. more expensive than that. But... Another way you can do it, and I see other people do it, is that they're hiring technologists and then training them to be accessibility consultants. And I would recommend certainly all the typical things. Go to IAAP, get certified, blah, blah, blah. But as a brand, why don't you hire Cam? Sorry, I'm going to talk about you, Cam, for a second. Hire Cam to come in and train your accessibility team to be an accessibility team, to provide them with coaching. I, I haven't seen anybody else doing that, but that would be powerful because... Isn't it? Yeah. Intense, 2023. Maybe yes. there's a course that's going to come out about how do you bring somebody from a, someone, someone who's empathetic Maybe to somebody. someone who can consult? Like, when, like, no one... That doesn't exist right now. It doesn't exist. It's a call me, brilliant call me. It's coming yeah. out. It's coming yeah. out. And, yeah. and I tell you, you, you know, just a tip for anyone who's listening who is struggling with that exact thing, start with your ERG groups. You've mm -hmm. definitely got groups inside your organization and they can go and start to form themselves self-form and, and, and grow as a, as a team to become those consultants internally. It is so powerful when you get somebody whose brother, cousin, friend has some kind of disability, or maybe they themselves have it. They don't want to self-identify, but they're definitely happy to help out with these groups. They are going to be the ones you start with. And absolutely, you know what? You, you, I didn't even need to say it. You said it already, but you know, like I didn't even say it to you in the, before the show, but you know what, this is, this is the path and, and really building, like, what does an accelerator program look like for accessibility? Oh, we need that so bad. I'm so excited. You need to take that to the valuable 500, all those amazing brands that want to include us. So, Kim, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you're doing. His company is Accelerated Accessibility, and I think he's brilliant. So, Kim, I'm hoping you'll come back on again and give us an update on what you're doing. But Absolutely, yeah, call me up. More than happy to do that. Yes. Thanks so much for having me on, Deborah. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Keith. everyone. Bye. You've been listening to Human Potential at Work. To learn more about Rue Global Impact, visit rueglobal.com. And to learn more about Billion Strong, an identity and empowerment organization designed to bring the billions of voices of persons with disabilities together, you can join the global community and donate at billion-strong.org. That's billion-strong.org.